I'm Michael, um, I play around with radio a bit, uh, and I'm aware that there are several people in this room who are at least as knowledgeable, if not a fair bit more knowledgeable about this stuff than I, so feel free to contribute as I stumble my way through this, uh, particularly this uh, set here with this bottle that he says flowing photo. It's very interesting to me. I'm going to talk a bit about radio, um, the beginning of radio from spark gap transmitters through to hopefully a bit of software to find radio. Uh, the idea was to be presenting from my Linux laptop, which is notably over there and not here. Um, it doesn't have HDMI out, so it can't be used with the recording system. So when I get to the part where I was going to demo stuff, um, it's going to be a little bit underwhelming because I'll do it over there. But the plan is, um, after I, I'll do this today, I'll talk about radio. Tomorrow, um, we'll have an opportunity for people who are interested in playing with radio to sit down with some software-defined radio dongles and have a go at setting up some software for different types of software to find radio stuff. And I think, for anybody who doesn't possess a dongle, I think I have enough spare dongles to go around. So let's go from the beginning here. This is going to be the plan of what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and get through the beginnings of radio. A few selected bits of radio theory, nothing particularly deep. Let's we'll stick to the basics pretty much. And then I'm going to go back in time to some traditional types of radio receiver and just have a bit of an explanation around kinds of radio receivers that have been in the past. And then we'll get to software to find radio and have a bit of a chat about that. So where did it all come from? If you've ever been listening to the radio, particularly AM radio, during a thunderstorm, you will have heard <coughs> of the bursts of lightning producing sound on the radio. Um, this actually caused some real problems back at the sort of beginning of radio in the late 1800s, early 1900s, in the, I think it was the late 1890s when Marconi was doing his experiments to try and send a signal across the Atlantic in competition to the cable companies. Um, when he was doing his experiments he had massive transmitters back in the UK and he had receiving stations dotted along the coast in the US and he was trying to get a signal across the Atlantic and when he finally did it, he sent the letter S in Morse code, which is dit dit dit, three little dits. And those three, three, those three dits in Morse code could easily be confused with atmospheric noise, lightning, anything else. And so they had to do it a bunch of times and they had enormous problems convincing anybody that actually achieved it. And there was a lot of pushback in, uh, when it was announced that they'd actually got a signal across the Atlantic. There was newspaper articles published of lots of people saying rubbish, that's impossible, it can't happen. Um, and the confusion about atmospheric noise versus an actual transmission really caused some problems for them. But this is what a spark gap transmitter looks like. This is kind of a modern one, and if it's clear there, you can sort of see that that's a car, uh, car ignition coil sitting in the background there. And there's the gap here where the spark is jumping. To make some sort of sense of, whoops, to make some sort of sense of what this is, this is, uh, this is Carden CAD. This is my uh, hand-drawn uh, <laughs> hand diagram. You get to see some awesome Carden CAD through this. Um, I'll just explain what this is. This is a basic circuit of a spark transmitter. And uh, just to familiarise you with a few of the, the symbols here, this thing over on the, the left is a battery, quite a big one. This component here is a capacitor, which <coughs> stores a charge of electricity. In the case of a spark gap transmitter, the early ones, this capacitor would be the size of a, a bedroom. They're quite big. Uh, up here, we have our Morse key, the button that makes it all happen. Over here, the spark gap itself. And then down this end, we have a really interesting combination of components. This is a coil, which we would call an inductor. And this one over here is a capacitor. And both of these components store charge in a different way. The inductor stores charge in a magnetic field around itself, and a capacitor stores charges in an electrostatic field between its plates. And when you connect, connect an inductor and a capacitor like this, it's called a parallel tuned circuit, or in the old days would have been called a tank circuit, something pretty special and magical can happen. If you can dump energy into there, <coughs> what will happen is you'll charge the capacitor up, and then it'll discharge into the inductor, which will then charge the capacitor, which will charge the inductor, which will charge the capacitor, and they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, with the polarity of the, uh, the voltage across them reversing every time one swaps with the other. If you choose the value of your inductor and your capacitor properly, you can control the frequency at which this happens. And so what a spark gap transmitter did, when you push the button, the Morse key, the battery charged the big capacitor with a lot of energy. And when it reached enough energy to cause a flashover in the spark gap, enough voltage sitting there that it punched through the air and made a huge spark, that energy is doing what a lightning strike does. You can hear that on the radio. This tank circuit is trying to take, the, take one part of that huge amount of energy and tune it for you and poke it up this thing, which is the antenna. And if it all worked nicely, you get 
close to a single frequency coming out. That's pretty crude, and the, the early ones were just two big balls like I showed in the previous slide, with a spark jumping between them. As time went by, they refined this and made mechanical devices to make the spark um, bigger, <coughs> and they had uh, spinning disks which had sparks bouncing off them to try and make them uh, generate sparks faster and faster. Uh, ironically, they perfected the technology of making big, powerful sparks just when that uh, technology became obsolete. At the end of the First World War, they had these rotary spark gap transmitters which were really powerful um, and very successful and very reliable. And just, just then, the, um, the valve, the uh, thermionic emission tube came along and valves obsoleted all that instantly. But this is where it came from. It came from the spark gap transmitter. So the thing that we're trying to get out of our transmitter is some electromagnetic radiation. And uh, electromagnetic radiation encompasses everything from radio through microwaves, light, x-rays, gamma rays. The only difference between them is the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation. And so we're familiar with uh, radio for AM and FM broadcasts, um, but we're, we're familiar with things like light and all the different colours of the spectrum. That's all just part of the same type of uh, phenomenon. It's electromagnetic radiation just in a different frequency. And it extends from, as has famously been said, from DC to daylight. So anything above DC, which is not electromagnetic radiation, it's, there's no change in the uh, no change in the voltage, so you don't have any electromagnetic radiation, through to daylight, which is very, very fast changes at very high frequencies. And so more card and CAD to explain what DC looks like. If you imagine a, uh, that's a graph with uh, voltage on an axis here, and you're measuring the output of an AA cell at one and a half volts, it doesn't change. It stays the same. So, well, if it's loaded and it's being discharged, it'll slowly decline. But if an AA cell just doing nothing will just sit there with a DC voltage that just doesn't change. In contrast, electromagnetic radiation is an alternating voltage. So the voltage swings. And if, if you had a, uh, a voltage of two, uh, four volts peak to peak, it would start at zero. And as time goes by, it increases to two volts, then goes back down through zero, goes to minus two, and so on and so forth. And this has two characteristics that are quite important, amplitude and period. So the amplitude is from the top peak to the bottom peak. In this case, four volts peak to peak is the amplitude of that uh, sine wave. Period is how long it takes to complete a sine wave. So from here to here is one complete sine wave, up, down, up again. But that's the period of the wave. So this brings us to radio frequencies. And this is a big list of radio frequencies, I don't know how readable that is from the back, um, from extremely low frequencies, which are in the 3 to 30 hertz range, and a hertz is just one, one cycle per second, one up and down in one second. Um, they're frequencies that have incredibly long wavelengths, like 100,000 kilometres to 10,000 kilometres, really, really low frequencies. And these aren't used a great deal. Um, I think the main thing that uh, really, really low frequencies like this have been used for in the past is to communicate with submarines because they're one of the few things that kind of works reasonably well underwater. And as you go shorter in the wavelength, you go higher in the frequency. And so the, the kinds of frequencies that most of us are familiar with in things that we would uh, deal with day to day, AM radio, whoops, AM radio is in the middle here in the medium frequency band where wavelengths are between about 100 metres and a kilometre. Um, and, our media, and our AM radio band from about 550 to 1500 kilohertz. And then we'd also mostly be familiar with uh, broadcast FM, which sits in this VHF area here, um, with wavelengths between about a metre and 10 metres, and frequencies 3 to 300, so you, you know, your 88 to 108 megahertz FM broadcast band sits in there. Through to these things that are getting used now um, for all sorts of weird things like uh, See, being able to see through people, etc., with these uh, terahertz frequencies, the very, very, very tiny wavelengths, they're the kinds of things that TSA uses to look through you in their examination places. Um, something else. I feel like tremendously high frequencies undernamed. They could have come up with. <laughs> I, I didn't actually know until I went looking for this table that there was a thing called tremendously high frequency. For practical purposes, most people sort of stop at about UHF or SHF. An interesting thing about frequencies is that in the early days of, um, of the regulating of radio, particularly in the USA, it was thought that frequencies above about, say, 50 megahertz were useless for any, any purpose at all. And because they were thought to be useless, they were just given to radio amateurs to play with. And radio amateurs went out there and made them really useful. Um, and suddenly the powers that be said, oh, they're useful now, we want most of that back again. And this, this has gone through in a cycle time after time. The amateurs get pushed up to higher and higher frequencies which are useless 
and the amateurs go and do something remarkable and make them usable, and the authorities come and say, ah, oh, actually, we want those back, they're valuable. Um, and we'd all know, so Spectrum is being sold for a lot of money because of mobile phones, etc., um, and all the other purposes, like our ESP8266s that we want to have using Spectrum. It becomes a very valuable asset. Now, I'll have a few words about antennas, <coughs> which is the thing you want to get your radio energy into to get it out there. Um, antennas are all sort of based on this imaginary antenna that doesn't exist, the isotropic radiator. The isotropic radiator is an imaginary dot in space which radiates equally in all directions. Um, and any, any real antenna is usually specified in terms of how much better than that dot it actually is. Um, but the, the isotropic radiator is like uh, the spherical cow in physics. It doesn't exist, but it's, you know, people try and, try and come up with theories that are based around it. So real antennas um, are things like dipoles, yagis, verticals, long wires, and they're all trying to be better than an isotropic radiator. A dipole just is, uh, just is what it says, two poles, um, and typically it's an antenna which has just two wires sticking out. Uh, a yagi is a development of that. It's a dipole with extra elements to make it perform better. And I'll show a diagram of that in a sec. Um, you have vertical antennas, and that, which that's a good example, leaning up against the wall there. <coughs> and, uh, and anybody who's ever really played with, uh, with radios as a kid, um, particularly if they played with crystal radios as a kid, would be familiar with the long wire antenna, which is the simplest and easiest thing to throw up in the air. The last thing to know about antennas is that the size of an antenna is related to wavelength. So ideally your antenna is, the, the length of your antenna is related directly to the frequency that you're trying to receive. Typically high frequency antennas, smaller. Low frequency antennas, much bigger. So some of the antennas for, um, for very low frequency work, you can end up with needing antennas that are kilometres long to be able to transmit a signal. So here's some more card and cat with uh, radiation patterns of antennas. So this one up here, this is your imaginary isotropic radiator, a dot that radiates equally in all directions. And you'll need to imagine the 3D-ness of this image, by the way. These are 3D. So this is a dipole over here, and it radiates off to the side like that, but actually that's a donut. It's a 3D donut that I haven't card and catted very well. And this one down here, this is a Yagi. And uh, in the middle of the Yagi, you see this bit here, which is actually a dipole but it's surrounded on either side by these elements here and these elements over here. Now the little ones here are called directors and the big ones here are called reflectors. And their job is to take the radio energy from this guy and point it in that direction with as little as possible going out the back here. So that, that becomes a directional antenna and it gives you the ability to concentrate the radio energy into a particular place and, uh, and effectively from the um, point of view of somebody who's listening for your radio signal, you, you appear to have a whole lot more transmitted power than you actually do. All right, propagation. This is all about getting a radio signal from one place to another place. And some awesome drawing here of the Earth's surface with my two antenna masts, huge antenna masts. Um, this is the simplest example of radio propagation and it's straight line propagation, two antennas that can see each other. And it pretty much doesn't much matter what frequency of radio operation you're dealing with. If the two antennas can see each other, things are pretty sweet. It's pretty much going to work without too much drama. Then we have ground wave propagation. And this is typical of low frequency radio. Low frequency radio tends to be propagated in a ground wave over relatively short distances. And this really bedeviled the early developers of radio because they discovered that radio would work uh, over land over short distances, over water over a bit further distances, but if you really wanted to go really, really long distances, um, ground wave propagation wasn't really successful. And they were experimenting with low frequencies before there was any knowledge that low frequencies were not going to help you here, and that low frequencies were going to mostly do short range ground wave propagation. And it wasn't until experiments were done gradually with higher and higher frequencies that they discovered that there are other ways to get uh, a radio signal transmitted. And this is the, this is the way that we recognize now, ionospheric propagation. So the, uh, <coughs> the curvy bit up here is a massively oversimplified ionosphere. The ionosphere is uh, made up of a bunch of layers of ionised gas in the atmosphere. And it has this wonderful prop property that at relatively high-ish frequencies, a radio signal that hits it at the right angle will bounce back down. And this is the way that eventually it was possible to send signals across the planet. And uh, ground wave propagation still happens, but it runs out fairly quickly. Um, if your angle of transmission or your frequency of transmission is too high, 
you won't bounce back off the ionosphere, you'll just keep on going out into space and not come back. But that's kind of useful if you want to talk to satellites or people on the moon. Uh, you pick your frequency accordingly and you'll get out of the atmosphere. A cool thing about the ionosphere, which took them a long time to figure out in the early days, is that the ionosphere moves. So uh, in the daytime, it comes down closer to the planet, and in the nighttime, it goes further away. And at nighttime, when it goes further away, those angles become much bigger. So you can send a signal a whole lot further. And anybody who's done any sort of um, trying to listen to distant radio broadcasts, maybe on the AM, uh, will know that you can hear interstate radio from all around Australia at night, which is just not there during the day. And that's because of the, the movement <coughs> of the atmosphere. <coughs> all right, getting the thing you want to transmit onto the radio carrier. In the early days of radio, it was all about Morse code, but eventually we wanted to be able to transmit other things. These days we transmit voice a fair bit of the time, but most radio transmissions I'd venture to say now are some kind of digital thing that's put onto a radio carrier. So the types of, and so putting something onto a radio carrier is called modulation, and it's taking, taking something that should be the information, be it the Morse code, the voice or whatever, or some digital data, and putting it onto a radio carrier so it can be pumped out the antenna to get to somebody else. And here are some types where everyone's probably familiar with AM and FM. The other ones I've listed there are single sideband, frequency shift keying, phase shift keying, and binary phase shift keying. All of those last ones are mostly used in, um, or exclusively used in transmitting digital information. And uh, uh, in increasingly what we see in radio modulation. There's a simple explanation of modulation for AM and FM. If the signal at the top was just your, your voice into a microphone, that middle representation there is that modulating a, a radio carrier uh, with amplitude modulation. So you can see that the voice signal is changing the amplitude of the overall radio carrier. Whereas down the bottom, we're modulating a frequency modulator carrier. Its amplitude is not changing. Its amplitude stays constant. Um, but the frequency is, is changing in response to the voice signal. And actually, again, this is from ideal physics land. Anybody who's ever measured a real FM transmitter knows that uh, they do amplitude modulate when they're not supposed to. Um, and also AM transmitters frequency modulate when they're not supposed to. But broadly speaking, this is the principle of how these things modulate. So how are we going to listen to these radio signals? Let's begin at the beginning with the crystal set. Simplest radio you can make. And uh, I used to have a lot of fun making these. They're actually, these days, they're getting hard to make because this component here, the diode, the signal diode that's used in a crystal set is a component that's used to recover the audio from the received envelope that we saw before. So that AM that's being amplitude modulated, the diode strips off the bit you want, the voice signal, sort of, in a fairly rough way, and makes it available to you to listen to. So to explain the circuit, it's an antenna again. We have that now familiar parallel tuned circuit of a coil and a capacitor, except this capacitor's got an arrow through it that shows us that it's an adjustable capacitor, so you can tune that circuit. And over here we have a pair of very high impedance headphones. And so you need a pair of extremely high impedance headphones and you need a, a very sensitive diode with a very small forward voltage drop, which is very hard to buy now, um, because the entire energy that runs this radio is energy that's coming in the antenna. It's coming straight out of the air. So there's no additional amplification. Um, if the voltage isn't available at the antenna, you're not going to hear it in your earphones. Typically what's turning up at an antenna is in microvolts, so it's difficult to get something that you're going to hear clearly. Um, but with a good antenna and a good earth connection, with an earth being the other half of a good antenna system, um, you can receive signals using such a simple radio. In the very early days, the, uh, the diode component was made of a crystal. It used typically a Galena crystal with a tiny little piece of wire touching onto it. And the earliest crystal sets to actually make it work, you'd have your earphones on and you'd be poking around on the surface of the crystal until you found the magic spot that worked like a diode. And then don't move at all until you... <laughs> The tiniest little movement to lose your radio reception. But that was, the, that was where the name crystal radio came from. But people are still making crystal radios. This is a fairly recent crystal radio from this century. Um, and so a lot of radio clubs run contests for build the, the most sensitive, the most effective crystal radio. This one has a whole bunch of separate modules which um, are on mounted on separate nicely lacquered pieces of timber. And the relationship of that coil to that coil to that coil in the physical positioning has a lot to do with the performance of the radio. And you'll see there's knobs for tuning here and here and here and here. And a fancy box up here that's got some transformers in it. And I believe instead of a diode, this guy was using a, um, a MOSFET for his detector. Um, but people are still into it and spend a lot of money. The wire that those coils are around with is made of unobtainium. It's really expensive to buy. 
Free hard fine. So this is the obligatory, confusing and difficult to read slide. Um, you've got to have at least one of those in the presentation. Uh, so this is a circuit of sort of the next generation of radio receiver that pushed the crystal set aside a bit. This is a regenerative radio circuit and I don't expect you to get any real detail out of this other than to see that there's an antenna up in the corner here, there's a transistor here, and then there's a little audio amplifier over here. The audio amplifier is not important to this. This transistor and what it does is important. And there's a little control down here, a little potentiometer that's labelled Regen 10K. And that's a dial that you adjust which changes the gain of this transistor as an amplifier. So this is a battery operated radio, it's got a battery here. This transistor is an amplifier. And the way a regenerative radio works is that it takes some of the output of the amplifier here and feeds it back to the input. That's what this capacitor is doing. It's feeding some of the amplified signal back to the input and back in there again. And when you provide that kind of feedback to an amplifier, it makes it it increases the gain of the amplifier, and the amount by which that's increased is controlled by this little control down here, the regenerative control. If you keep increasing the, the gain of the amplifier, and keep winding it up and keep winding it up to listen to that uh, quiet radio station you want to hear, eventually that transistor turns into an oscillator and it will squeal very loudly in your ear. So to operate the radio, you would use the tuning capacitor, which is over here, tuned to where you want to listen to, and then you crank the regeneration control up until it starts squealing and taking your eardrum out and you back it down a little bit. And that's at the optimum operating point. Now, that meant that listening to the radio was fiddly. Um, but worse than that, regenerative radio receivers, when they get to that oscillating bit, they actually turn into a radio transmitter, which is unkind to anybody who's within cooey of your little regenerative receiver because you're going to be blatting them with the signal coming out of your antenna, which is not very friendly. So the regenerative receiver was a huge step forward from something like the crystal radio because you had some active amplification, but it's fiddly and it's not very friendly. So after that, and so no Carden Cat here, Carden Cat was getting, uh, uh, running out of bits of paper to scri scribble on. Um, this is actually from Wikipedia. So the next one along the line was the tuned radio frequency radio receiver, and I've gone from circuit diagram to block diagram. Um, make it simpler to understand. So a tuned radio frequency receiver had multiple stages of tuning to get to the end result of being able to listen to audio. And this was um, a lot less risky in terms of making interference for other people than a regenerative radio receiver was. And uh, initially it was thought that it was going to be an easier thing to operate, but what really happened was this. You end up with a box that has all those knobs across the front. So this is in the 1920s, it's quite typical. And this was typical of the kind of receiver that would, if somebody had a radio at home in the 1920s, it was very likely to be a tuned radio frequency receiver with lots of stages separately tuned um, to be able to listen to radio stations. So high barrier to entry to be able to get the thing to work. But these days, we use pretty much every radio receiver that you're going to encounter um, say a car radio or radios at home, is going to use the Super Heterodyne receiver, which, is our, uh, which has been for probably, uh, probably 80 odd years the, uh, the design to, to make radios out of. And its key change to the other style of radios is that it has a thing called a local oscillator. And the local oscillator is an oscillator that sits in your radio and makes a little signal of its own, just like a radio signal that's coming in and the radio signal that's coming in gets filtered and amplified a bit and then it gets stuck into a mixer with the local oscillator and the mixer takes the two signals, two sine waves as it happens, and it multiplies them and when it multiplies them it spits out a bunch of other signals. Um, the most interesting ones are the sum of the two signals that went in and the difference between the two signals that went in. So if you started out with a local oscillator that was uh, oscillating at 500 kilohertz and you had a signal coming in of 1500 kilohertz the output of the mixer would be 2,000, which is the two of them added together, and 1,000, which is one, one subtracted from the other. And the cool thing about this is, it means that you can choose the frequency at which you want to do your amplification. And typically, you want to do your amplification at as low a frequency as you can, because you can make a much more stable um, and much higher gain amplifier at relatively low frequencies. And in particular, if you have an amplifier that doesn't need to be tuned, like in the TRF receiver or the Regen, you can stick with something that's going to produce a higher, um, higher sensitivity and higher selectivity than you would get out of the other designs. And typically, this is showing one uh, local oscillator mixer stage. Typically, most modern radios, particularly FM radios, would have at least two stages of, of down-converting through a mixer and an uh, intermediate frequency amplifier. 
So that's pretty much what we see for pretty much all radios now. Except for these guys. <coughs> so, software defined radio. All the things that I've been talking about so far, tuners, mixers, filters, amplifiers, and the modulating and demodulating is all done in hardware. Software defined radio aims to do it slightly differently where you ideally, in the idealized situation, you have an antenna which pumps something into an analog to digital converter and then software does some magic and then you get an output. <laughs> it's the software does the magic bit that's a little tricky. Can you do more finger wiggling? This, this is the picture of the ideal SDR. That's my laptop side on the TV, that's not obvious. So it's an antenna going into an analog to digital converter and into a laptop and everything's wonderful. And that's your, that's your idealized SDR. However, a real SDR is a bit more like that. Uh, and actually, this is, this is a simple SDR, so that's, that is actually literally the block diagram of this guy. So the title up the top is no elect SDR, that's what this is. This is a software defined radio dongle. Uh, and this is this block diagram. Again, too much detail for a slide, but mainly I just want to make the point that it has a tuning bit up here. It has the analog to digital converter that I mentioned earlier here. Digital signal processing and then some USB out over here, and that's what comes out here. So from antenna to USB out, one of these. So these days, if you're going to buy a dongle-style uh, software-defined radio, this kind of thing, um, you pretty much have a choice of two types, and even of those two types, one of them is almost impossible to get now. The Elonix E4000 tuner, and they're, they're determined by the type of tuner they have, these little dongles. So um, the Elonix E4000 tuner, it had the advantage of going up higher in frequency um, than the other commonly available ones, so it would top out at 2200 megahertz. <coughs> these common ones that are around now, these the R820T tuner, these top out at 1766 megahertz. And I've never, come, I've never heard why there is a gap in the Elonix tuning range from 1100 to 1250. Is there some secret thing that the manufacturers didn't want you to be able to listen to in that band? Who knows? Um, now I should say that, that at the outset, these, these dongles um, are kind of repurposed now. Their original purpose was to be a digital video broadcast tuner for, for watching television on your computer. And some clever chappy about eight years ago discovered that you could actually get access to the, what's, the uh, demodulated signal that's coming out of them to do software-defined radio with them if you wrote some drivers to do it. And so now that's a very popular thing to do. Um, but if you're ever looking to try and find these things, if you put R820T into your search engine, you will come up with about a bajillion uh, eBay ads for, for these things. Which brings me on to the software, uh, which is the bit where I was hoping to have my laptop here so I could show you this is what this does and this is what this does. Um, but I'll just run through some of this for you verbally. Anybody who's got a Linux system um, will have access to a bunch of command line interface tools called the RTL library. So uh, all the package managers pretty much can install this and uh, that will give you a suite of tools starting from a thing called RTL test, which lets you test one of these things and make sure it's behaving. Um, there's a little FM radio tuner thing in the command line tools. Uh, so it's about a, a half dozen or 10 little command line tools that let you control these things from scripts, which is kind of handy. Also, most modern Linux distributions will have access to the GQRX software, which is a nice um, GUI interface to a software-defined radio receiver. Uh, well, and if you, if you want it for other operating systems, you can get it from gqrx.dk. My current favourite, I think, of the software for uh, running on a Linux machine for, for software-defined radio is Cubic SDR, um, and it's a really nice GUI application for doing um, SDR, and I, I have it there to demonstrate. I would like to have shifted to doing that, but I might just fire it up in a sec anyway. Uh, and also quite liking Shiny SDR, and Shiny SDR is one which is a client server application. So you start up a little Shiny SDR server on your machine, and then you point your web browser at it, and your web browser provides the interface. The cool thing about that, of course, is that you could have that running in one place, and you could look at it from somewhere else and you know, do it across a network. Uh, and then there's SDRJ, and this is the thing I went to, the, to talk about at Clug the other month where I brought a Raspberry Pi along. SDRJ is digital audio broadcast receiving software. Again, it's free and open source. Uh, it will run on a Raspberry Pi 2 or 3, uh, as well as on uh, more powerful machines. And it's quite cool. Um, in Canberra, um, I can receive 18 um, digital audio broadcast radio stations. And software-defined radio being what it is and the way this works is it's receiving them all at once. Um, and you just 
choose the one you want to listen to now, but it's decoding them all in the background at once. You, you say, oh, this is that one now, this is that one now. Uh, and that's a, that's a cool thing, a little bit fiddly to build, um, but if anyone's interested, we can play with that tomorrow. And last but not least is uh, Dump 1090. And Dump 1090 is software for receiving ADS-B broadcasts from aircraft, automatic dependent surveillance broadcasts. Now, I know there's at least one person in the room who's done a heck of a lot more with this than I have. Uh, see another one. Stephen's, Stephen's done quite a bit with this. He's probably, I think he's got running his laptop there at home at the moment. One you've had earlier, yes. Um, so this is another one thing we can play with. It lets you plug one of these things into a laptop um, and then on a, on a real-time map on your, on your web browser, see aircraft that are commercial planes that are flying around and, uh, and who's running them. So what I'm going to do is just quickly over here, wake up my laptop and just do two quick things that maybe you'll be able to see but you'll be able to hear it. I'm just going to run uh, the RTL FM tool, which is it's spinning up a nice long command line that says RTL FM minus M WBFM minus F 100.7M play R 32K T raw E's S B 16 C 1 V 1 dash. Got that? It's user friendly. Yeah, yeah, very user friendly. <laughs> and the result is <laughs> not particularly good audio. Get down, Bob is gone. So that's a bit awful. However, proper software with one radio app like that. Thing. And any questions? That's all in. Good. Okay, right